Oh, this is incredible. Welcome to Cathedral of the Madeline. Hey, I'm Matt. This is the 10 Minute Bible Hour. And whether you're into the whole Christianity thing or not, I bet you've heard of Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. These are two different expressions of Christian faith. They're kind of two of the three really big ones historically. And Protestantism is about a 500-year-old expression that was born out of Roman Catholicism. Some theological issues were percolating and people were debating them. And ultimately, these two groups ended up deciding, we're just doing different things here. We think different stuff. And there's this parting of ways. So like your Lutherans, your Methodists, your Baptists, these are all different types of Protestants, whereas Roman Catholicism continues to be kind of a, a singular monolithic thing. I've always had pretty good relationships with Roman Catholics. Um, I've always had pretty high regard for Roman Catholicism, but it occurred to me the other day that pretty much everything I know about Roman Catholicism has been taught to me, told to me, explained to me by other Protestants. And I just thought, you know, at some point it'd be pretty cool to go and hear what Roman Catholics think and see what they do by talking to an actual Roman Catholic in an actual Roman Catholic church. So I put out feelers with a whole bunch of different churches and one got back to me called the Cathedral of the Madeline in Salt Lake City, which is actually secretly who I was really hoping would get back to me. And they were kind enough to take a flyer on some Protestant stranger from the internet and invite me there with a camera to see what happens. So I went, I met with Father Martin Diaz and well, here's what happened. Oh. Father Diaz? Hi. Am I saying that right? Yes. Father is the correct title? That's the correct title. All right. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome Thank to you. The I'm Matt Whitman. Nice to meet Matt, you, sir. great to meet yeah. you. I'm walking in here clueless. I have a billion things to learn. And the first thing that I see as I walk up is that the front of your church looks a lot different than the front of my church. Can you just walk well, me through what this means? This is called a tympanum. Okay. And it's, of course, the crucifix there. And you have Jesus in front. And this is Jesus, the high priest, or Jesus Christ, the king. Okay. All right. The idea, of course, is that you're being welcomed by Christ. Christ is sitting on top of the world. And so that coming into um, Christ, who is the universal salvation. Are those like straight up so, Notre Dame style so, gargoyles up there? Uh, they're actually fake now. <laughs> oh, they are. So, so they deteriorated so much um, from 1909 mm -hmm. to 1993 when we did the restoration. Mm -hmm. Okay. that they were taken down and uh, fashioned out of concrete and then put back up. So those, so they do not work as gargoyles. Gargoyles are downspouts. Yeah, why make them look like that? Like griffins and like some of the gargoyles that so I've seen even the, look kind of like demonic. Yeah, to keep away the, kind of scare off the evil. Okay, Yeah. so, this, uh, so that's kind of a leftover from like European folklore oh, sure, sure. and yeah. stuff like that. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you stuck yes. with it because yeah. they're incredible. Okay, so this stained glass window up here that I'm looking at. The rose is, window. It, it is called the rose window. Yes. It's like Notre Dame. Yes. It's, well, uh, it's, they're all called rose windows if they're round. Oh. So yes, that's, so the, the, round, the round rose petal. So, and, and the idea of, the, of that is the rose petals. <laughs> so that's why it's called a rose window. I, see, I'm already learning things. I yes. thought it was just like some special nickname that, that was like this special unique thing right. for just this one like place. rose color or something, uh, but no. See, this is why you ask questions. Yes, it's, yes. I guess you have to have a building that can support that big of an, you know, sure. like that, that size of an open space right. in order to accommodate that kind of stained glass. Right. Is there stained glass inside too? Yes. Can we go poke around? Sure. All right, let's do it. Let's go. Welcome, Cathedral of the Madeline. Um, the it's stunning. <laughs> angels at the top and down here, the, the ground and the earth here at the bottom. How long did it take to make this? So it took 10 years to build the cathedral. It was started in 1899 and was completed in 1909. Where do I even start? I mean, there's so much going on in here in terms of imagery. I, maybe you could just walk me through the stained glass and what these represent and, and the story behind them to start with. Where do we start with the stained glass? <laughs> <laughs> the side windows are the mysteries of the rosary. So it starts with the angel with Mary, okay. Mary going to Elizabeth, Mary and Joseph, the birth of Jesus, the presentation in the temple, and then Jesus at 12 years old in the temple. 
On, on this side, then, the three mysteries of the rosary that are not in the Bible. This mystery is the Holy Spirit coming upon the apostles, the Pentecost. Okay. And then the last two, Mary taken into heaven and Mary crowned as queen of heaven and earth. So that's the mysteries of the rosary. And, and the rose window, again, rose windows are classical in this kind of a cathedral. In the center is St. Cecilia. And she is known for music. So she's depicted with kind of a, a rudimentary organ because that's where the organ loft is. So St. Cecilia is the patron saint of music and that's why she's in there. And we I'm have- stuff. I did the, uh, the Foo Fighters have an album or a song called St. Cecilia and I had no idea yeah, so, right. what they'd pick on that. Now I get yeah, it. Yes, the I'm learning saint. things about rock music from your rose window. Kind of the masterpiece, if you will, yeah. is in the apse. So Jesus is divine, 100% divine, 100% human. Okay. So it's earth, humankind, and divinity. It's the sky, the heavens, and the earth coming together. You're entering sacred space, which is where you, even though we're grounded on earth, are touching heaven. So for us, the Eucharist is three events in one. So it's the Last Supper, so every Mass is the Last Supper. Every Mass is in the present moment, right. okay. and every Mass is the banquet in heaven. You're saying that word is, is, is with tremendous it, emphasis. It, 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 so there, it is, there's only one event. There's only one sacrifice. So it's not a repetition of no, that event. It, it's, not, it's not a recollection. It's an it's atemporal not, version of that event. Right. It, it is the Last Supper. There's only one sacrifice. Okay. And it's the last, it's Jesus. Do you see my Protestant right, brain right. trying right. So to the, wrap it? So, right, so it's, <laughs> so it's the cross. Okay. There's o he only died once for right. all, Right. once for all. And the, the Last Supper is the unbloody sacrifice of the cross. Okay, so okay. this right. is my body, this is my blood, which is offered on the cross. It's his body and blood that redeems us, his, mm -hmm. his death. And so, so every time we have mass, heaven and earth come together. Whether you're in the Cathedral of the Madeline or, you know, in a... So it's all one mass. It's all one mass. Okay. It's all one event. And it's, but it's outside of our... So we, we left the world behind. Mm -hmm. We left time and space outside. We left our world outside. We're in a world, and whether we're in this space or we're in um, a village someplace in Cambodia or Africa or where, you know, whatever country that would be, you know, it's the same heaven and earth coming together. And so our architecture and art help to depict that. Yeah. Help okay. us to understand that. But it's not necessary. Does that make sense? You yeah. know, I, I want to go all the way down the rabbit hole with you on I, the, the mechanics of that. Maybe when we sit down, okay. I can pick your brain more so, about how that happens. So you also, so this is a cruciform church, okay? Right. So you've got, so you got the crucifix up there, and then this is a cruce, crucifix. So the altar in this, so this is architectural for this church. Not the altar doesn't have to be here, but in this architecture. The altar is where the heart is. So the pouring out of God's love from his heart okay. <laughs> comes from the altar. So this is the gifts of grace flow from the altar. And behind the heart is the head. In the cathedral, what makes a cathedral to be a cathedral is the chair, the cathedra. It's unique to every diocese has a cathedral with a cathedra. But not every church. Not every church, Which just is? cathedrals. Gotcha. And there's one in every diocese. Okay. And so that's our chair for the Diocese of Salt Lake City. Who sits in so that So that's chair? uniquely the bishop of our diocese. That's his chair, uniquely. Okay. So the chair sits at, at the head because the head of our diocese is the bishop. So does he celebrate mass weekly here? Is he around a lot? How does that even? Well, luckily he's not around a lot, no. <laughs> Keep that. <laughs> no. so, so he's here for, uh, not every Sunday, but um, a lot of Sundays and then the special celebrations that we have. So does he conduct those services when Correct. he's here or do you? No, he does. Okay. It looks like a European coat of arms up above. Correct. What does this mean? So each coat of arms is meant to pull something out of the area and or the person. His coat of arms is a three-part coat of arms 
coming out of who he is. Okay. And the, the, the saying underneath, the motto, changes from bishop to bishop. It seems like there's a lot of moving parts. Is, is this, so do the, you teach from here? So that's the, the, the scripture is read from the ambo. Only scripture and sermons, homilies are given from there. We feed on the word of God from the table of the ambo. All right? What does ambo mean? Pulpit. I mean, okay. It just means stand. Okay. You know, some fancy word in either Greek or Latin. That sounds good <laughs> you know, to me. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> and so we talk about the two tables of the Eucharist. You know, you go back to Acts of the Apostles. What did they do? When they met for the breaking of the bread, they read the scriptures, which of course for them was what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures. They read from the scriptures and the breaking of the bread. Mm -hmm. right? So every mass is reading the scripture, breaking the bread. So then if that's what you do in every mass and every mass is the same, then everyone is always taking yeah, communion, the Eucharist together. Yes, so we are okay. at one, as Jesus says, may they all be one as the Father and I are one. Yeah. So in communion, we are one. Because it's a sacrament, it does what it says it does. It, it has a reality that's beyond your reality. Yeah. It makes you one. It's, it's almost like translating two languages right. from all of the language that I've been raised around my whole life and right. in you know, the, the Protestant notion of symbolism that we are, you know, this is a separate thing and we're, we're commemorating an event that we would view as a singular event at the cross. And so it's, it's fascinating, it's pushing me and I appreciate right. the idea of the universality of that singular event because, well, of course the cross was one event. I've just never really thought about the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist being a singular event as well. So do you serve from, so, so from here? So then the altar, and so the first part of the Mass, we have the chair for the prayers at the beginning, then the scriptures, the sermon, homily, then we move into the second part, which is the Eucharist. So the bread and wine is prepared on the altar. Mm -hmm. Usually we have a procession with the bread and wine, and then the Eucharistic prayer, the consecratory prayer, doing what Jesus did at the Last Supper. This is my body, this is my blood. So that all takes place on the altar. And then um, at that part is over, we move into the communion part, which is, starts with the Lord's Prayer. Okay. So we do as Jesus, there's a, an exchange of peace that we do also in our right. And then from the altar, we take communion to the people. And this is, so what, what we're supposed to be doing is that the people are supposed to come to the altar to receive communion. Like you would come to the table at home. You sit down at the table okay. to eat. So they're supposed to be coming. So the, the idea of the procession is that you're coming to eat at the altar. So they, they line up right they down line the middle up. here? And, but okay. of course they don't come up to the altar because it's, they're, you know, just... It logistically. Would, logistically, okay. that right, work. All right. Um, but that was in, uh, in the past when you had an altar rail around where people took communion from the altar rail. The rail was an extension of the altar. So they come in procession because it's an altar call. <laughs> oh, okay. again, that language it's, means something it's a little different. It's an altar tradition. call. Yeah, so okay. if you right. believe in Jesus, if Jesus is your savior, if you want to receive the body and blood of Jesus, come on up. That's what, that's what we will say it that way. <laughs> so a non-confirmed Protestant could take communion? No. So only so if you believe and you've been confirmed. And yeah, you sign the Catholic doctrine, okay. you can come all in. Right. All right, all right, I'm Cause there's, Because it's that I wasn't one, trying to get greedy. No, no, because it was that oneness. If we're going to be all, if it's everybody one, then we all doctrinally need mm. to be one. Okay. Okay, so there's, oh, I must admit, there's probably some, people that have received First some, Communion. Some real sneaky ones. Yeah, yeah. come yeah. in. And okay. we preserve the Blessed Sacrament in, in a tabernacle. Oh, so is that what this behind, is? Which is behind here, and we'll, we can go. Let me show you the tabernacle. Yeah, I'd love to okay. see it. So the tabernacle here is where we, we keep the Blessed Sacrament. We have a light that lets people know that's there. And it's just, it's the communion that's left over. And you can't and, un transubstantiate what is already cannot, the body and blood of Christ. You cannot untransubstantiate. Okay. So once it's the Eucharist, it is the Eucharist. Which happens and there? There. Okay. So once you say the prayer, it is Jesus. So what is in here 
is the, all the post little tiny prayer. holes. <laughs> okay. And that. So and it's all post prayer post that's prayer. in here. Okay. So we preserve that in here and we use it. And then over the centuries, people said, well, you know, if I believe that was Jesus over there, then I believe there's Jesus here and I'm going to come and pray. Well, where am I going to come and pray? Pray in an empty building? No, I'm going to come and mm. pray and then I'm going to light a candle and then, you know, and now 2,000 years later, here we are. So this is in, in Roman Catholic theology, this is part of the, the presence of Christ. Right, right. And in, in this church, it's here again because it, it belongs, I mean, in a way you would say that the head is right here in this cruciform, oh, yeah. you know. So again, so everything is Christ. Christ is the altar, Christ is the people, hmm. Christ is the Eucharist, everything. Everything says it's Jesus. You're connecting the dots <laughs> yeah. with all of that for right. me better than anybody ever right. has. So thank you for your patience. You're, with welcome. My, you're welcome, you're uh, welcome, you're welcome. With my, my uh, fifth grade level questions here. There's something yeah. else that stands out to me back here. This, so that's a reliquary. I kind of suspected it might so be. So that's a reliquary, and a reliquary is, has something based on a saint. Okay. So what we say is that that is a relic of St. Mary Magdalene, who is the patron saint of our church. Cathedral of the Madeline is Mary Magdalene. So there's something a couple thousand years old in there? Yeah, so a little tiny bone fragment, and that's all we know. Okay. I mean, that's, we only have that, and it's believe that that's that. And that's, and that's, that's tucked kind of away in the Tucked away room. in the, you know, behind the fleur de lis and there, okay. you know, all right. I mean, and, that. and then Mary Magdalene, of course, is at oh. the foot of the cross. So Mary oh. Magdalene appears three or four times in the church. Is this a reminder or is there a, a spiritual no, it's, reality? It's to a it? reminder that, that we're connected. We're connected to our patron saint. So, and it just turns out that our patron saint knew Jesus. Yeah, okay. even though as a, uh, the, she's a part of the church triumphant, right. that relic, does that mean that she is present in the same way that Christ is oh, present? Oh, no, no, not at all. It's a... So, so no more, she would be like any other believer. So it's, she, it's reverence, but this is Jesus. <laughs> so I mean, he is I, here, I, she right. is remembered. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. And... And it's, it's just meant to make a connection. And most people probably don't even know that that's a relic of St. Mary Magdalene. This is called the Ambry. 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 Okay. So every church has an Ambry, which is where the holy oils are kept. So these are the oils, the urns that are actually blessed every year by the, the oil inside is blessed by the bishop. This bishop? This bishop. Okay. And, and where does the oil come from? What's it made it's of? It's olive oil. Olive oh. oil, and, and then the chrism has a, a balsam perfume in it. So, so, it's, so it's, it's all the same oil. Is there some sort of spiritual transformation yes. or transaction uh, that's the blessing occurring? Is, is, the blessing is for each oil in particular. Okay. So the, the, the oil of, for the sick is a healing blessing. The oil of the catechumens, meaning those who are coming into the church, is a... Well, catechumens are kind of a spiritual, kind of get out the evil okay. blessing, okay. if you will. The gargoyles? And, yeah. And then the, the chrism oil is the Christ oil, is the anointing oil of confirmation, ordination, and that, the, the sealing and, and the, the configuring to Christ oil. And in that oil, when it's blessed, the, the bishop breathes on the oil because his spirit like Christ mm -hmm. breathed, I mean, mm -hmm. God breathed mm -hmm. into the dirt and got Adam and Eve. <laughs> so the bishop breathes into it for his spirit then resides, Christ's spirit resides in that oil because he is Christ for us in the sense of, you know, the, a vicar of Christ, if you will, one who stands in the place of Christ and then that. So, so it, is, it, is it oil instead of water because of a reference to like the Old Testament anointing? Yeah, you know, and, anointing, you know, so when they anointed a king, Samuel anoints David, he breaks the horn of oil, mm -hmm. pours it on top of him, and so that, that's okay. that. Okay. And in James, you know, call the presbyters, have pres, presbyters, have them pray over you, oh, and, yeah. and, you know, anointed with oil. Is, so, is this another re relic so, here? So this is a relic of the true cross. So this is in Catholic theology. So we have um, very small pieces of the cross of Jesus. So that's 
we have one. The, so, so this would be the one recovered by St. Helena in right, the fourth century. in the fourth century. So they say that pieces of that have been spread throughout the world mm -hmm. and we have one. Mm -hmm. it's, yes. Yeah, they, I mean the historian in me just wants right. to be like, well, okay, well, how do you... How do you know that and how did it work? We have one. So we come down here. Is there significance to the baptismal font being at the foot of the cross? So the baptismal font is for the entrance into the church. Okay. So it, it doesn't have to be here at the entrance of the church. Okay. But in, we were able in our 1993 restoration to place the baptismal font here. And because it's the first sacrament, so it's a sacrament of initiation. So how do you get into the church? Interesting. You were baptized, right? I mean, enter. I so just never thought of it as being chronological. Before you're baptized, you're not a member of the church. You're not a member of the body of Christ, correct? Right? I mean, it's different right? in other traditions, no, but I yes, mean, I understand. I mean, you're, you're a pagan. <laughs> you're, not, okay. You're, okay. Not, you're not a Christian. Here we have our confessionals. Tell me about that. Let me show you. So again, they don't have to be where they are. Okay. But in this church, they're on either side. So not every church has an ornate wood carved confessional. Okay. We're lucky. <laughs> okay. Okay. In our confessional, there are two sides. So I don't know, you can come Am in. Am I allowed to go in? You can come on in only if you're a sinner. Oh, well, uh, well good. <laughs> so I, I do that in, in our confessional, the priest sits on one side and the people have a choice. They can sit, talk face to face, or kneel and speak through the, anonymously through a screen. And surprisingly enough, people will kind of look and say hello and then kneel down anonymously. Oh, really? For many people, the anonymous is, I'm not talking to this priest, I'm talking to God. The priest is just listening for God and they wanna talk to God and say, okay, God, these are my sins and this is where I need help. Mm -hmm. So that others, when the people sit face to face, often it becomes more of a, of a conversation. These are my sins, you know, can you give me some advice, some help mm -hmm. and that. And each confession takes three minutes, five at the most, unless someone really wants to talk. Okay. Um, it can be, it's a very short experience. Come in, when was my last confession? These are my sins. Here's a penance, here's the absolution, I'm sorry for my sins, absolution, blessing, out what, what is a penance? So the penance is something that you do that kind of says you were sincere. Okay, so, it's so like a, stopping doing the bad thing I was well, doing? Well, I use, it's like usually like saying an Our Father, praying an Our Father, praying a Hail Mary, praying maybe a decade of the rosary. What, I'm, I'm so ignorant, what are those? So the Hail Mary? Yeah, or the Our prayer, Father. The Our Lord's Prayer. You oh, the, okay. The we Lord, call sorry, that the Lord's Prayer. Yeah, Protestant, like, we got different language. Okay. I okay. thought, what? You don't know the Our Father? No, I do it's know the that Lord's one, prayer. actually. You know that one. <laughs> yeah. so, and, so I always say, pray one Our Father and one Hail Mary. Hail Mary is the prayer that comes from the angel. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Okay. Angel Gabriel. And then the last part is, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. So it's just asking Mary, pray for us now. Okay. The hour of our death. And okay. So, um, so sacrament of healing, people go to confession once, once a year, twice a year, once a month. So just everyone has a different kind of style for conf kind of time period. On um, on Netflix's Daredevil, which is my main source of information about confession, <laughs> okay. it seems like they always open with how long has it been since your last confession. Yes. Is that real? Do you so, do that? So you do that, and why do you do? We can step out. We don't have okay. to stand in here. I, I think it's really neat. <laughs> so if you tell me. It's been one month since my last confession, and I missed going to church twice. Mm -hmm. So that's two out of four. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if you tell me it's been one year since my last confession, and I missed church Sunday twice, that's two out of 52. So, you know, it, gives you, so, so it gives so you context? It gives me a context. It helps to understand okay. um, kind of what, what the person's working on and how, you know, it doesn't make any difference in the sense you know, but if someone said, I've been a year since my last confession and I've not been to mass at all, that's, that's a whole year's worth, you know, that's a different kind of response, if you will, than if someone says it's been a month and I haven't been to mass. So, 
So this is a kind of a, an acute, something's going on right now. What is it that's preventing you from going to mass? So how can I help you get closer to God? Yeah, it, well, it's an entirely different pastoral exercise right. for you right. to work with somebody right. who's maybe kind of walked away right. from their right. faith Just, than I mean, somebody who really wants right, to get right. it right in his bed from, here. From the, kind of the, the forgiveness point of view, it's the same. God forgives you. Whatever you did, God forgives you. Hmm. But if I can help you, I need a context to, to offer some kind of gentle advice or push or, you know, have you thought about it this way? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense in terms it of... It does. It does. Yeah. That's something I can relate to. So, a practical question. Yes. If this is shut, can people hear you out here? Uh, no, it's, pr it's a heavy door. Do you get a line sometimes? Oh, yeah. I hear confessions for an hour. People, people back up. Yeah, people back up. They're eager to it's be here. Hour. And again, why do, people, why do people line up? It's a profession of faith. Yeah, it's interesting. We stepped in there and maybe it's the architecture, maybe it's the environment, maybe it's something subconscious is, is brilliantly crafted into this. Maybe it's the fact that I'm also a Christian, but my inclination was, I want to turn these off and shut the door and <laughs> shut talk the door for and, a minute. Yeah, talk. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's, I, um, Every once it's the first in a time I've we, ever been in, in one of we these. We get non-Catholics who come and sit and ask mm -hmm. for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. and that. So it's, um, Maybe we could have a conversation yeah. about that before I go. Yeah. That's pretty much where we wrapped up the tour, but there was so much other interesting stuff that I'm sorry I wasn't able to cram into this edit, but here are maybe the two biggest things that I personally am going to take away from this experience. Thing number one, I was struck by how utterly cohesive Roman Catholic thought and practice is within the context of a few key Roman Catholic assumptions. It is so easy for me to do this routine where I sit over in my little intellectual thought bunker echo chamber and imagine that everybody who thinks things that are different than me is just crazy. How could you believe something like that? Or intellectually dishonest, you're lying to yourself over there. But not only is that not true of most people, it's mean on my part. Now, the reality is that most points of view are rooted in a few key assumptions and then whatever happens after that flows pretty naturally out of those key assumptions. Same thing here. If you answer a, a few key questions about Jesus' relationship with the church, if you interpret a couple of pivotal passages a certain way, you're just going to be Catholic and everything's going to play out exactly the way it's played out. If you answer them a slightly different way, you're probably going to be Protestant and they're going to play out that way or Orthodox and they'll play out that way. Whatever the case, this was a humbling, helpful reminder about that reality. Second thing that really stood out to me here is, and you could probably see this coming as you were watching the video, but the confession bit there at the end uh, kind of got through the armor for me. Um, the longer we were in that room and talking about it, the more I started to think about myself and about God and who I am and where I'm at with things. And I found myself really wanting to try that out. And so uh, Father Diaz said it was fine to take confession from a non-Roman Catholic. So after the cameras turned off, we shut the door and we did that. And I know I can have that conversation anywhere, anytime with God if I want to. But there was something very powerful about having Father Diaz sit in on that conversation and about the environment and context in which we had the conversation. So huge thank you to the Cathedral of the Madeline for hosting this Huge thank you to Father Diaz for the time, the honesty, answering my questions, even when he suspected we might disagree or maybe it would make me uncomfortable. He shot straight with me. What more can you ask from somebody than that? And finally, if some of you just watched this video and you're sitting there saying, well, why didn't you press him further on that? Or why didn't he push back on you on this point a little bit more? We actually have a second half to this conversation. Father Diaz and I did a sit down interview where we cover a lot of those key theological differences that I referenced just a second ago. I think that conversation is really worth your time. It has a little different flavor than what we just did. And so if you want to catch that video, I would be so honored if you would consider subscribing to this channel, which now because of the way YouTube works is kind of a twofold process where you got to click the red subscribe button and also hit that little gray bell or else they don't let you know when a video comes out. But if you would consider doing that, I would be very grateful. If not, 
It's cool too. I'm just glad that you're here and that you're up for conversations like this. I'm Matt. This is the 10 Minute Bible Hour. Let's do this again soon.